Yeah. Yes, yeah. now it's good. Yes. So hello everyone, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Elena Polivtseva. I'm here as an independent cultural policy researcher and I'm very happy and uh, honored to moderate this very important panel with um, this brilliant group of real experts in rural arts. So we have with us uh, physically here Ralph Lister, who is executive director of Take Art, supporting promoting arts and rural settlements of Europe. We have Rocio Nogales, um, representing Culture Action Europe. And we also have somewhere on screen, or maybe not yet on screen, but they're definitely listening to us, two other brilliant speakers. Hen Kayser, who is uh, representing Art and Rural Area Network, Area Network. And we have Laure Hubert Rodier from UFISC, from France. And just in five minutes, they will talk more about their project and about their organizations. So this panel now is about the international, the cross-border European dimension of rural arts. So we had, have heard a lot uh, this morning and in general in the, around this forum about the value and the power of arts to revive rural areas, about the role of rural arts in uh, rural settlements and villages. We also heard that challenges that artists and cultural organizations that work in rural areas are very different, they're very diverse and very specific. And also the tools that artists and cultural organizations in rural areas use to engage with their audiences, to produce their work, to disseminate it, they're also very different and very diverse. And all this is because rural areas in Europe are very, very different from each other. So there is one million of settings, environments, and that's why it's quite interesting now to speak about what unites all those practitioners. What is this common ground that uh, they all find uh, when they get together at the European Union level? Because there is a growing tendency of artists and cultural organizations working in rural areas to collaborate across borders, to find um, opportunities to learn from each other, to benchmark, to uh, get together and to do things together. So this session is about the value of this European action. We will also try to think about what, what can the European Union do to support these networks? Why should it support these networks? And finally, we would also think what is currently missing in a policy framework that would support these networks? And also how rural areas and arts in rural areas can actually contribute to huge, ambitious um, strategy that the European Union now put in place to revive rural areas. So, and, and this note, I'm passing um, the floor to speakers. I just want to say something very boring, but very important, and also, especially those who listen to us, listening to us now online, please stick your intervention to six, eight minutes, because we want to have an interactive discussion after your presentations. We're very curious to hear about your expertise, about your project. So, Ralph Lister, your time starting. Uh -huh. Hello. Okay. okay, thank you, Elena. So, um, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, the Spanish Ministry of Culture uh, for the invitation, and to Benito and Rafael and the other members of the team uh, for inviting me. Um, I'm also, it's a slightly strange, I'm very pleased to be here, but it's very strange that from the UK, uh, we're kind of outside the European family, it seems. So I feel really pleased that I'm still involved in working with the European partners through the Sparse project. So Sparse, you'll see on the first slide, it says Sparse Plus, and I'll explain a little bit about uh, that in a moment. But as it says, we, uh, the, the organization there is to support uh, arts in rural settlements of Europe. Can I have the next? Okay. So, um, the new project, the original project started with four partners in Estonia, Lithuania, uh, Romania and Italy. And we were delighted that we were successful in an application in September of last year for Sparse Plus, which is a new four-year program. Uh, we're delighted to have New partners, so the partnership includes the Czech Republic, Estonia, Germany. We have two partners in Hungary, two partners in Italy, Lithuania, Poland, Romania, Sweden, and we have an associate also in Norway. And the scale of organizations are very broad. Uh, uh, Shoshin Theatre in Romania, a very small theatre company based in uh, Cluj. Uh, and then we have Amat, which is a really quite an extensive Arts Development Association covering Marquet 
in, in Italy. So here you've got some, uh, I wanted to show you some pictures. So uh, uh, the first, the, the larger pictures of a professional dance company, Protein Theatre, who made a beautiful performance called May Contain Food. And as you can see, the, the, the proximity of the artist to the audience is, really creates an incredibly special atmosphere. And this show was uh, very interesting because during the show, they had text, they discussed with the audience the importance of food. Uh, and during part of the performance, they, they baked a cake. And during the second half, you could, you could smell the cake as it was cooking. And at the end of the performance, they invited the audience to come and share the food with them. You've got two, Im two images of uh, community buildings. So our work takes place in, not, not in theatres, but in community, community owned spaces. So we're bringing, we're bringing the arts into those spaces. And it's important, I should say, that we're not missionaries. And it's not like we are bringing culture to rural, rural areas. Rural areas are not empty spaces. They have a vibrant culture of their own. Uh, and for me, it's important not to objectify rural areas, seen as a, solely as a kind of a laboratory for artists to go in and to experiment with. These are living organisms in their own right, and we need to respect the people that are living in those communities. Uh, as well as performances inside, uh, we also encourage performances outside. Obviously, the climate in the UK makes this a little bit challenging. Uh, but uh, the spaces that we work are can be adjacent to uh, those local uh, to the to the local areas, to the communities, and we found that in we, we did an evaluation of our sparse uh, project, which showed that 50% of the audience lives less than five kilometres from their village hall. So, in when we're so concerned about the climate, the idea that people live so close to where they experience the arts is very important. Okay. Uh, so, in the local promoters, so how do we reach our audiences? Well, we, as agencies, we spend a lot of time developing contacts, relationships with really important key people. It may be one person, it may be a group of people in that particular community. It could be a teacher, it might be uh, a, a priest, it could, be, it could be a local authority person, or it could even be an artist. Sometimes it's a group of people, and here I'm showing some images of some of the uh, promoters that we have in the, in, in, in the, the original partner countries. Um, and I'm going to read a couple of quotes, because I think to bring... These people are volunteers. They don't get paid. And they're the people that generate the audience. We don't have sophisticated marketing me mechanisms. We do use social media, but word of mouth. And quite often, people come to the event um, not because they want to see the show, but because they want to see their neighbours and they want to mix with each other. So, this is a quote from a Lithuanian local promoter. Local people willingly attend the performances, get to know the actors, and in this way can feel that art is not so far away from them. Often our options are limited, so when we can call a professional here, it's a big advantage for us. It's a real joy to be able to show it to ordinary people and to see the viewer and the whole community grow along with the culture. So food, uh, conviviality are essential ingredients to this kind of work. And from an audience member in Italy, finding shows near home is stimulating and necessary because culture has to come everywhere. Culture nourishes the soul. So the next slide. Uh, oh. Can we, uh, so this is a, an image from one of the, the halls in uh, Romania that we promoted in. Uh, that's that one. Um, let's have a look. Toolkits. So uh, we wish to be very practical in the work that we do. So if you go to the Sparse website, uh, there are toolkits that we've created. One is for local promoters, how to put on the show. One is for artists what to think about if you want to bring your work into a, into a rural area, uh, and also one for networks. So we're very keen to spread the message, and as you can see from the first to the second project, we've grown from five partners to 11 partners, and we hope over the next four years uh, that we'll be able to grow the network further. Um, in the UK, we produce this uh, toolkit for artists, which is called Eyes Wide Open, 
and it's kind of an A to Z of how to put, how, what to think about if, if you wish to bring a show into a rural location. Um, uh, I'm involved in the UK in uh, a six-year initiative, which is about bringing contemporary dance to rural to rural areas. So this is, a, and what we do is a really important part of this work is that we don't tell the community what the show is going to be. We create a menu. So the community chooses the show, and this is really important because if you choose something, then you have greater investment and a greater sense of ownership over it. Uh, the image on the left is a, another free download from our website that we produce through an Erasmus uh, a Plus project. Um, in terms of uh, influencing policy, uh, making things happen, there was this book called, a report called Only Connect that uh, I was involved in commissioning back in 2003. And it's really important for us to have research, to have data, to have statistics, to make our work, which generally is small and invisible, visible. So Only Connect by Francois Matarasso, and it's available as a free download, is a really, really interestingly written uh, document, docu document which talks about the whole, uh, the ecology of rural touring. And the other document, which is produced by the Arts Council of England, uh, is called, it's called the Rural Evidence and Data Review. Uh, I was part of a panel that commissioned this piece of work, and this gives us really, really important statistical evidence. So I can tell you that while 17% of the population in England lives in a rural area, only 2.5% of funding from uh, the government through the Arts Council goes to organisations that are based in a, in, a, in a rural area. So for me, there is an inequality that is an issue that I would like to see addressed. And I'm sure the picture is probably similar across Europe. I'm starting to wind up now. Um, so Sparse Plus, some uh, headline um, uh, uh, points. Four-year project, 11 parts from nine countries. There are three touring periods, so there'll be 100, 150 performances over three years, 50 in each year across the member network. We'll produce more toolkits for the countries that are, that are new to the project. We're also developing a digital mentoring program, which we hope will be recorded and, and be available as a free download. We have a symposium in the Czech Republic in 2025, so we're hoping to grow the network, and if people from Spain wish to come, we'd be delighted to see you. We want to carry out research into funding for rural areas uh, in Europe with regards to culture, and research into the opportunities and challenges for artists wishing to tour into rural areas. Um, and at the end, we're going to create a new incorporated organisation. Um, in terms of relationships with Spain, um, we already have, I have relationships with a number of organisations in Spain, so uh, I, I visited the Danza Triactos in uh, Zaragoza, I've been there several times, and while it's a city-based organisation, the values, the empathy that we have is very strong, and they have a really beautiful uh, relationship with the artists and their desire to communicate with the general public in unconventional spaces. Uh, Sismograph Festival, we were involved in a uh, Perform Europe project, and uh, one of the artists toured to Sismograph in uh, Olot. And uh, in February this year, I was in Andalusia, I went to uh, Aracena. I was invited by the uh, Andalusian Dance Federation, I think, to explore uh, dance uh, spaces in unconventional areas around the, the, the whole locality. And in fact, the, the company that performed this, this morning were in residence in Aracena, and they made a very beautiful work in progress at the end of the event. Ralph, I think you have something last thing to say, right? Yeah, this is this is second last slide. So, uh, uh, crossing borders, perform Europe. So, IETM. Uh, I had contact with Ellen, Elena when she was working at ITM. They have this project, Perform Europe, and we had this crossing borders. So, we brought a, a Polish company uh, into several countries, and we brought a, uh, a Moroccan. Uh, parkour artist living in France the, who went the other way. And we learnt a huge amount, not least that the artists were exhausted uh, by the end of their tours, something that we want to learn from. Um, yeah. So uh, these are my contact details, and uh, I'm around till the uh, end of Thursday. So if anybody wishes to have a chat with me, I'm here. Thank you very much, Ralph. I must say, I did promise you that I would stop you, right? 
you asked me about it, but I didn't <laughs> stop. So the first commitment is smashed. But it's true that the Spars project is, for me personally, is like a flagship at the European Union level, which is not only about modeling new things, but also about collecting knowledge, about collecting um, different insights, and interestingly connecting these very specific local realities to, together to each other. So it's a, indeed a very interesting um, example. But now we're happy to proceed further. So Rocio from Culture Action Europe, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Elena. Thank you, Ralph. Eh, voy a dar tiempo a las traductoras para que cambien y a los compañeros para que se pongan el, la, la traducción simultánea. Voy a hablar en español, incluso en sevillano, que es lo que se me escapa. Eh, gracias, gracias por, por invitarnos tanto a CAE como, como a REAC, que de hecho yo estoy representando a CAE hoy, pero gracias a REA, que yo represento a la red de espacios de a, a, red de espacios y agentes de la cultura comunitaria REA en el, en el board, en la junta directiva de CAE. Y, y es importante, eh, no solo que estamos ahí, bueno, pues estoy allí representando a, a REA, sino también un poco la razón por la, que, por la que llego yo a la Junta es precisamente para reforzar o tratar de reforzar dos aspectos que, que CAE considera fundamentales. El primero es eso, la presencia del arte y de la cultura en, en, en los ámbitos rurales o en el campo, como me gusta a mí decir. Eh, eso por un lado. Y luego un poco eh, el reforzar lo comunitario, las prácticas comunitarias y la cultura comunitaria. Entonces, bueno, eh, desde, ese, desde esa perspectiva, y además he tenido la suerte de que Lars ha tomado la palabra, eh, otra de las cosas también que, que, que intuíamos hacía falta desde el principio era desarrollar lo que llamamos el, el Hub Spain o el, o el Hub Español, el Hub España, en fin, ya ahí nos metemos con los líos de las traducciones. ¿Por qué? Yo creo que una de las cosas que, que, que se está viendo y además cuando, cuando corriendo nos, nos ponemos a comunicar con otros agentes en otros territorios y todo, nos damos cuenta de, de dos limitaciones para mí muy fuertes, bueno, para mí, para, para las compañeras. La primera tiene que ver con esa necesidad de traducción, que es de traducción lingüística, pero además de traducción del vocabulario específico, del vocabulario que quizás se ha desarrollado en unas áreas o en otras, pero sobre todo en el ámbito de la incidencia política. Entonces, bueno, ahí eso es una, es un, son temas que no son baladí y para los que yo bueno, pues solicito recursos, porque además eh, va a ser sin duda una de las demandas que vamos a hacer y, con, y, y debo decir que por el momento parece que estamos teniendo buena respuesta desde las distintas instituciones, la necesidad de tener acceso a esa información en, la, en los distintos idiomas vernaculares de, de los distintos territorios, pero además, decía que, que esa es una de ellas, pero otra es un, un poco la, la idea, por un lado, la idea de la, de la traducción, no solo lingüística, sino también, como decía, de los vocabularios específicos, pero también la idea de la agencia, o sea, la idea de qué papel jugamos cada una de las organizaciones, cada uno de los colectivos, en esa en ese subir y bajar, en ese diálogo, en ese eh, eh, trabajar juntas, abrir grietas, seguir abriendo grietas y tratar de compartir eh, los saberes y, y el conocimiento que se genera en ese, en ese construir, en ese tratar de, de seguir construyendo y transformando juntas, eh, qué lugar ocupamos. ¿no? Entonces, yo creo que, que muchas veces eh, el entender que no es solo una, un, un, una cuestión de recursos, de tener dinero para... Porque una de las cosas de las que nos damos cuenta es de que al final quien acaba teniendo incidencia, quien acaba teniendo voz, que al fin y al cabo incidencia significa voz, incidencia política, advocacy, lobby, como lo queramos llamar, significa, significa tener voz. ¿no? Entonces, una de las cosas que para mí y para CAE y para REAC es una... Es una es motivo de, no solo de esperanza, sino de alegría e incluso diría un poco de triunfo, es esa, esa sensación, esa percepción de que territorios que hasta el momento o hasta hace muy poco tiempo estaban silenciados, estaban callados y estaban invisibilizados, comienzan a articular y a alzar su voz. Entonces, yo una... ¿Cómo voy de tiempo, Elena? Tres minutos. Uh, 
I, I don't think you have any time left, but I think we all kind of, when we get to speak, we, we, we no change de, the rules a little no bit, llega, so no, just please. Nos dejamos llevar. Entonces, bueno, eh, un poco como para, luego hablamos, luego seguimos hablando, que es un poco lo que también me interesa y luego también lo que vosotras podáis lanzar hacia hacia acá, pero una, o sea, como algunas claves ¿no? de las que estamos trabajando, un poco al hilo también de lo que decía el compañero y de los que mucha, muchas de nosotras estamos trabajando, esa necesidad de unir, asociar y entretejer transiciones. Que estamos en un proceso de transición, es claro, y con, la transición, con las transiciones pasa como con la política, o la hacemos o nos la, o nos la hacen. Y estamos de hecho, siendo testigo de un montón de aspectos en esas transiciones que nos las están haciendo y probablemente eh, estén sellando un poco el, el destino de, mucha, de muchas comunidades. Yo, una cosa que me parece muy útil es, por ejemplo, mirar a otras transiciones. Cuando, cuando miro, por ejemplo, a la agroecología, miro a la transición energética, miro a la movilidad o incluso... Eh, a, a incluso lo digital o, o lo político y social, pero aquí me voy a referir sobre todo a la transición energética. Para mí hay tres claves en la, en la transición energética a nivel europeo, se habla siempre de las tres Ds. La descarbonización, la descentralización y la democratización. ¿vale? Yo creo que el trabajar en torno a esas tres, obviamente, en nuestro campo, una, una cosa que proponemos es esa, esa desespectacularización, y me vais a perdonar el palabra, pero es que así suena, eh, es la idea un poco de el retirarnos de todo eso que es la cultura del espectáculo, todo eso que es la cultura que nos ciega y no nos deja ver no solo lo que hay detrás, sino no vernos las unas a las otras y no ver lo que hay más atrás, eh, y pensar un poquito desde esa, en clave de esas tres D, ¿no? esas tres D para la cultura, que son la desespectacularización, la democratización y la descentralización. Y, desde, y tirando un poco ¿no? de, de la descentralización, y con esto ya cierro, Elena, esa idea de que cuando hablamos de acceso a la cultura, derechos culturales, democracia cultural, no es solo acceso a lo que otras producen, no es solo acceso a un espacio como este, que ni siquiera está garantizado, eso se ha dicho, sino además es el tener acceso como ciudadanía a la gestión de esos recursos. Y ahí es donde muchas de nosotras empezamos a hablar, Lars lo decía también, él hablaba de autonomía, autonomía, autonomía. Bueno, esa idea por lo menos de la soberanía. Yo pienso que, de nuevo, prestando ese término de la agroecología, la soberanía alimentaria, ¿por qué no hablar de soberanía cultural? Y ahí sabemos que lo rural, sabemos que el campo... Es, es donde reposan un poco la esperanza de reconectar con esos ciclos, esos ciclos naturales, esos ciclos de vida de la naturaleza y nuestros, donde podemos empezar a repensar los modelos que, que están acabando con nosotras. Lo dejo ahí. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I think you raised very important, interesting points and, and such keywords like agency, autonomy, ownership. I liked a lot this spectacularization. I think all this is a model that is born in rural areas, which is, as I can hear from you, is not being listened enough. I think probably urban and, let's say, like more holistic society would profit from, would learn from it and inspire. But we will talk about it a little bit later. Thank you very much. You. Now we are going to connect with our speakers that wait for us online, so I hope we can see them. We are going to Hank Kaiser, which probably if Hank, if you are connected or if anyone can give us a sign if Hank is connecting. I, am, I can see you and I hear you there very is, well. There is. Okay. Hello, you hear us, right? Yeah, yeah, very well. Perfect. I see you, Ms. Bell. Perfect. Hello. Yes, hello, Hank. Very pity you're not here with us, but at least now we see you much bigger than we would have seen you otherwise. You are like, yeah, like the whole wall is Hank. So please, <laughs> you have your approximate eight minutes. Okay, thank you. Yeah, likewise, it's a pity not to be there. Um, but um, I have put a few words on a paper, I call it a, a PowerPoint presentation, so you can follow what I am talking about. Um, 
This is supposed to be my. Can you see this? We can see that, but there are no PowerPoint slides. There's just a big stripe. <laughs> Maybe this oh. is what you call PowerPoint presentation. Not, <laughs> normally not. <laughs> no. um, wait a minute. No. We tested it and it worked. What now? No, we don't see it, but I, I let oh, you... Oh, I see that it is stopped. Okay. Uh, okay. Maybe try once um, again and then take a decision to speak without. Yeah. <laughs> I will do that. Try to speed it up. Yes. Is this yes, better? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Cool. Um, okay. I'm um, representing area. Um, arts in rural European areas. Um, we started in uh, 2020 after a meeting in uh, the IETM meeting in Hull, where we gathered some artists, uh, different organizers, scientists, policy makers, activists. Um, and we thought we should meet a bit more because what we had in common was that we all, uh, what you can call, said our way of working was dig where you stand. I think that we all uh, work in rural areas or were interested in rural areas, but and we wanted to know more. We wanted to connect with the place where we are, um, with the people that, that live there and are interested in their stories, in their way of living, and especially how they think about their future, when it's about all the transitions that are happening. Um, and the aim of area, in fact, was um, to dig deeper. Um, we uh, had some, um, quite a group, and we, th and we saw that we had different uh, fields of interest. Um, so we thought of, let's start in this network to, to have a possibility to exchange our, um, our experiences, to know more about each other, to hear how people have different methods that they use. I think that Ralph already talked a bit about these kind of the different methods that we have. Um, we also wanted to collect data because, uh, um, because you really need data, as Rolf, Rolf already um, said, if you want to have your efficacy going well, you need to know what you talk about, even on a, on a local re and a regional level. And also we, we had meetings about how to, how to help each other in our efficacy. Um, we are stimulating uh, co-productions, how people can work together, different members, and we are starting to organize rural labs because after the whole corona period, meetings online every week, we, um, we feel a need to, to work together, to produce at the same spot, but also at, at that time to learn while we are producing. So that resulted in, in different working groups, uh, groups that are, and we had these meetings uh, every week, somebody, one of the groups prepared um, a, a meeting online. It was about methods, different ways of, of working. You have to think about how do you connect with your local community? Uh, how do you hand over results? How do you deal with the ownership of a story or, or the, the artistic results? We worked on efficacies and have a lot of information about how you can do it, but we do not have the financial means to publish it. Um, we have a, a quite a vivid working group about creative communities, environment, sustainability. Um, and uh, we had meetings called uh, Area Meets the World, as if we were not in the world. But we had great meetings with also with uh, artists and organizers in, for instance, Latin America or Australia. Um, we had um, we have a group that is still going on meeting every week almost. is still about community arts and well-being in small communities, and we have every month an open meeting. And what I said, we are preparing these rural labs, uh, uh, really meeting each other 
and working together for a period of time. That's in development. Uh, so a network by volunteers, nobody's paid. We have now uh, almost 50 members. We are in, diff in 12 countries. We meet once a month online. We are preparing rural labs and we are preparing, uh, but it's also a question of money, of, to have a research on how we, we want to know more about policies and the support for arts in rural European areas. We would like to do that in cooperation with other organizations, but such a research is, is quite a bit. Um, and we know from different countries already how, how subsidies are divided, especially between the cities and the rural areas. Um, for us in the future, now it's, it's in, when you talk about our transnational issues and questions, um, we, we, we see ourselves as part of rural development. We, we live in rural areas and we are part of the, the changes that are happening. But I see that it's very hard that the rural development workers and the art sector is quite divided. Um, and we are very concerned, especially about uh, the jobs for young creators, young artists. Uh, people leave, and that has also to do with, with keeping the, our areas alive and vivid. And, uh, and on the other hand, we could uh, contribute to a better cultural tourism. Um, we can see art as a connector. Uh, between all the different sectors. And we see that a lot of the, 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 the changes, especially when it's about climate change, are not going fast enough or good enough. And it has to do with the silos between sectors. And we can really see art as a cross-connector because we bring people together. We listen. We tell the stories of other people. So, um, and we are able, because it's our field in the arts, to create images, also about a future that's possible, because I see that a lot of people have a problem of what's going to happen now that we cannot do this anymore and we cannot do that anymore. That's how a lot of people in rural areas, uh, I think, experience the changes. And another thing is for me is the, the funding. We are constantly seeing that there is a kind of urban norm in the funds. Our ways of working need an other way of funding. We do slow touring. We are much more engaged with the place where we are. We have to build up trust. We have local anchors and from there we build. So this whole way of, of working in a few weeks creating a theater performance, it doesn't work. Uh, so in that way, and that is a bit connected with the rural development, I think we need another, a better access to cultural funding. Um, this is for now what I had to say, and we have a, an, uh, a web page where you can find more. That's Thank it. You. Thank you very much, Hank. Very interesting, very interesting about the network. What uh, caught my attention is what you said in the very beginning about your vision and aim, dig where you stand and dig deeper, so which is kind of an invitation to be very, very local, to be very um, attentive to, to where you are, but at the same time you speak across borders, so you manage to uh, connect actually at a European level, so that quite interesting to see how do you dig all together in where you all stand. But we'll talk about it um, in, in five or, or ten minutes. Now I would like to um, invite our uh, other panelist, Lor. I hope Lor is connected as well. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, very well, very well. Hello, Lor. Great. Hello. Uh, so I'll share my screen because I also did a PowerPoint presentation because sometimes it's easier um, to follow. I don't know if you can see the PowerPoint. I think you do. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for this uh, invitation. Uh, thank you, Elena, and for uh, the rest of the speakers. Um, 
there's a lot of things that are uh, resonate uh, that resonate uh, with what uh, we do at Ufisc. So I'll try, uh, so in a brief time, to, to tell you more about uh, also what resonates and, and what we do. Um, so uh, just um, to, to tell you uh, where I'm speaking from, uh, it's from so UFISC, so it's a French national network in the arts uh, and culture field that was created in the years uh, 2000. Um, and so we, we represent uh, 16 member uh, networks, uh, our professional organizations in arts and culture, uh, representing through those networks more than 2,500 structures, uh, organizations, companies uh, in France. Um, so in various sectors, uh, which is very interesting because we are uh, cross uh, sector, so uh, working with uh, popular music, theater, uh, visual and plastic arts, uh, dance, uh, theater, uh, radio, uh, street arts, etc. Um, and and uh, we also are, are here to defend a, a multitude of activities, uh, whether it's uh, creation, uh, production, um, uh, dissemination of uh, those actions, but also um, uh, uh, cultural education, uh, etc. Um, what brings us all, all together are shared values. Uh, so uh, you've talked about uh, cultural rights. Uh, it's something that is fundamental in what we defend, uh, as well as uh, social and solidarity economy, because all the networks we represent uh, uh, recognize themselves from the, this uh, economy. Uh, we defend uh, diversity, uh, cooperation, and co-construction, uh, especially of public policies. Um, uh, so uh, I've put the link to uh, the manifesto. Sorry, uh, we we that uh, brings us together, which is the uh, manifesto uh, for an alternative economy for arts and culture. Uh, and the three main activities uh, we do at UFISC are um, observation, study, research um, uh, to 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 create and uh, disseminate resources and toolkits. Uh, for uh, for uh, uh, artistic and cultural initiatives, and uh, ad advocate and uh, and make uh, public policy recommendations. So it's also um, things I think that were already mentioned: the, the necessity for observation, resources, and advocacy. Uh, so why culture and reality? So from all those networks and from all those uh, different structures, obviously a lot of them are in rural areas. Uh, we've um, for a long time now, uh, more than 10 years, worked with a lot of our uh, member networks uh, on this question of artistic and cultural initiatives in rural areas. Um, there was uh, a lot of misrepresentation on what was uh, rural areas, uh, what uh, initiatives there were on those territories. So I guess uh, we all, uh, I think, have those same um, problematics uh, issues uh, in each country, it's the opposition, opposition between urban versus rural areas uh, and a misrepresentation of uh, not having culture uh, in rural areas. So as it was said, also a concentration of uh, means, especially financial means in urban areas versus rural, uh, that are also an issue that uh, we try to, to to address uh, by doing uh, public policy recommendations. So uh, what we've done uh, since those 10 years trying to was to participate um, in changing those misrepresentations, sorry. And so uh, through uh, bringing to light and to valorize those initiatives, artistic and cultural initiatives that exist in, in rural areas and show the diversity and how uh, innovative they are and actually have uh, also uh, been a lot of, um, of um, uh, a lot of urban actually uh, nowadays initiatives take roots from urban uh, from rural uh, uh, initiatives. Um, so there was also uh, wanting to uh, accompany and produce resources for artistic and cultural initiatives uh, of a lot of uh, know-how and a lot of uh, good ideas, good practices that we wanted to share. And then uh, there was the idea to advocate uh, for more uh, um, pre uh, precise public policies uh, for rural areas, and especially the recognition of culture 
uh, in uh, public policies for, for rural areas, as it was already said. Um, very quickly, uh, because I think I only have a few minutes left, uh, what, what we can see is that there's two main, what we call two main modes of action in rural areas from artistic and cultural initiative. There's uh, the, the artistic and cultural projects that are traveling in rural areas going uh, towards uh, the, the, the people in, in, in those places, infusing uh, practices involving uh, inhabitants and, uh, and doing uh, 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 partnerships and, and, for example, a company that plays uh, uh, in, in, in non-cultural dedicated space but are still uh, cultural in itself. Uh, what we've been seeing for the past uh, 10 years is also that what we notice is how there's a, a multi-activity in those initiatives. It's very, um, there's an interdisciplinarity uh, uh, from those initiatives. Uh, there's also a, a big conviviality to those initiatives. There's a creation of interpersonal and also intergenerational links that are very important in those uh, initiatives. They're hybrids, uh, they're uh, uh, also on a cooperation uh, basis. Uh, they have a lot of uh, values uh, that are, for example, in the uh, horizontal mode of governance in the sense that it's uh, initiatives that are especially uh, shared with everybody uh, implicated in it. So those are a few elements that we could have seen. Uh, from from our different uh, projects that we've been uh, working on on this specific topic, and so what we've um, come to defend is the idea of uh, territorial cultural projects, in a sense of the needs to um, implement a territorial dynamic at a living area, not only administrative uh, territories of county councils of local councils, but really where the people live and what they want to do. Uh, the importance of uh, defending culture uh, and culture in a, uh, in a broad sense, as you uh, already mentioned, and, and defending cultural rights uh, in, on those territories. Um, having a bottom-up uh, logic uh, and anchored in the realities of the territories, because there's a lot of similarities, but there also is the specificity of the territories to, to, to defend. And also to defend the fact that uh, we need um, a bonds with other uh, sectors uh, within a territory. So have a link with other actors in the social inclusion, agriculture, uh, environmental, uh, also uh, actors. Um, to defend cooperation and to finance that cooperation is also something that is very important for us. Uh, and also to uh, um, uh, bring all together uh, local uh, officials as well as the administration of, of local authorities, uh, the artists, uh, uh, and, and defend also social and solidarity economy as an alternative. Uh, and just to finish, um, so we do so through uh, mobilizing, so within the territory, so as I said, local authorities and rural cultural actors, as well as other uh, uh, actors. Um, and we do so through uh, the constitution of resources, uh, through booklets where we uh, valorize, bring to light those initiatives uh, to, to make them known. And we also uh, do so through um, learning communities with peer-to-peer uh, -peer exchange, uh, considering that everybody has something to bring to the table and to exchange. Uh, and of course, uh, support uh, through uh, trainings, uh, and financial uh, means. Uh, and so we do uh, also have so uh, a learning community today that, that, is, um, that we try to animate uh, through projects uh, that we do, uh, which is based on mutual knowledge. Uh, we also uh, organize national and territorial meetings, uh, such as uh, the forum today, for example, to continue to exchange on those issues. Uh, we do trainings and we do uh, have uh, the, the, to disseminate uh, resources and as we can call sometimes toolkits to, to, to share good practices. Um, yeah, so I, I, I don't want to take the floor too long. Uh, so 
uh, I've put a few links on, on several projects that we've been working on. So uh, Agitaire Through Culture, which is uh, also a, a project specifically on initiatives, uh, cultural and artistic initiatives of young adults in rural areas. So what you said, Hank, also uh, the importance of supporting young adults uh, from 18 above uh, because uh, there's also a lot of uh, uh, young people saying that without, with, if there's no culture in rural areas in, in the place they're living, they cannot stay uh, and there's this need to support it. Thank um, you very much. Thank you, Laura. And yeah, and so yeah. those other projects that we, that yeah. we work on. <laughs> That's perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, so Jan, our very diverse panel, we have heard a lot of interesting elements of those models that are being born in rural areas or those models that are being inspired by rural areas. We talked about Art of the Connector, Dig Where You Stand. We talked about, uh, we heard about solidarity, economy, alternative models that um, Rose just spoke about. I would be very curious to ask um, you, Ralph, about what are the common challenges? Because you work across 11 countries in Europe and again, all your stakeholders, I understand, they are quite locally oriented. But I guess when you get together, you hear these common challenges, common issues, or maybe, let's put it more positive, common values or common aspirations that you might have. So my question would be, what are those? If you can very briefly name like three main <laughs> things that unite you, and maybe also say, like, why should you actually continue work across borders? What is the value of trans-border action in your case? Sure, so the, uh, the challenges, um, uh, I would say that um, language can be uh, a challenge. We, we had a, uh, a meeting, a Zoom meeting for all the new promoters. We had 50, 50 local promoters from eight different countries. And it was really exciting because uh, since April, uh, Zoom gives us this facility now to have subtitles. In, in, and when we had the meeting, we had every language apart from Lithuanian. Uh, so people were able to access, uh, it, as it were, in their native language, and we were able to set up an audio channel for Lithuania. And we think this will be really useful for the, uh, the mentoring program that we're going to develop over the next three years. And a lot of that mentoring will be peer-to-peer, -peer, where we take experiences from one country and we share that across to the rest. Um, I think travel, uh, is, a, is a massive challenge. If you imagine, if you, if you work, uh, say, for example, capital city to capital city, say you went to uh, a project from London with Madrid, you think about the travel, it's reasonably obvious, but I, I work on a, on a, our office is on a farm in the middle of Somerset in the southwest of England, so, you know, I have to get to the train station, then I have to get to the train station to London. Uh, we encourage overland travel, so then I make the, the travel to maybe Madrid, but then if I want to go to, well, and when I went to Arathena, you know, I had to get the train to Seville, and then someone picked me up from Seville. So the time it takes, the travel costs in terms of uh, uh, communicating with each other is really challenging. Um, I think that in terms of the values, uh, one, of the, one of the really fascinating things, we, we, we have a, a kickoff meeting as it were, for the local promoters. And in the previous project, it was in Cornwall. So we had 20 promoters from four different countries. And what was very, very interesting in one of the sessions was that one of the Romanian promoters said, oh, this is really weird, this is really interesting, that I didn't realize that people in Estonia are feeling the same way that I feel in my own locality. And there is a kind of a reality, which is that the, the, the rural promoters across the different countries in some ways have more in common than they do with their colleagues within their urban, not urban, but within their geographic uh, hinterland, if you see what I mean. So th this gives a sense of identity, gives a sense of acknowledgement that we do exist, so. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would like to go back to Henk, maybe Henk, in very briefly, like in two or even one minute, if you could build up on what Ralph said. What did, in your opinion, um, is the value of, um, of connecting across borders and actually to overcome all these challenges, which I think what Ralph mentioned are quite common. What is the value? Why do you keep on meeting with your area network, even if, as you said, you have such limited uh, resource uh, base and you're also doing it in a volunteer basis? 
It has a lot to do with what Ralph just said. We, 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 we feel connected uh, and, we, um, and we see that we are in, a, in different uh, uh, areas where we uh, have a lot of things not. But, we, sh but we, we learn a lot from just our meetings of sharing experiences. Um, that I think is the main thing and helping each other how to overcome these uh, these problems um, and and one of the, the great things is we had a meeting um, at the end of the IGM in here in Aarhus and it was so good to have a bus with 25 people going to see our projects and everybody understood what it was about what the, what how you connect locally how you what what how you hand over to local people that is that is but we could learn from each other how we do that what the basic um principles mm -hmm. are and the other hand also this this thing what what i called the the urban and rural norm um because that is one of the things that we constantly are facing that we have with the funds um uh, with um constantly have, have this kind of explaining that we work in a different way. And this, well, in fact, it is supporting each other in building up arguments for advocacy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's quite interesting that our discussion evolves all over again, this lack of recognition, lack of ownership, lack of agency. That there are these great models that exist in rural areas, this um, very kind of, it's actually happening. That's what everyone wants, sustainable community building, like it's happening in rural areas. And you spoke, Rossi, you spoke about um, this kind of how can we, as I understand it, like subvert the pyramid, like how can we actually say what should happen and not being led? So how, do, how in your experience this cross-border action helps? Um, a ver, cambio, cambio al español, eh? Cambio al español. Uh, so you may want to wear those. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Um, a ver, la, todo, todo lo que sea aprender de experiencias de otros territorios, evidentemente eh, nos enriquece, pero, pero también creo que, que, que muchas veces tenemos que pararnos a, a ver dónde estamos eh, y, y tenemos que ver también que, bueno, cuando se habla, es verdad, se habla del potencial del, del campo, se habla del potencial de la cultura en el campo, se habla de algunas de las claves para que esa cultura y ese arte sea, sea, digamos, pueda inspirar transformaciones. Pero no nos podemos olvidar también que en el campo sigue habiendo lógicas de extractivismo muy, muy, muy intenso y que la gente que vive en el campo, no toda la gente que vive en el campo, eh, ve este, este potencial de transformación de la cultura. Y para mí eh, es fundamental el que a las personas, a, las, a, a, la, a los agentes, a los colectivos, a las entidades que están en el campo, se les dé los recursos para poder acceder a ese conocimiento que existe más allá de las fronteras. Pero claro, volvemos un poco a lo mismo, a los obstáculos. ¿Cuáles son los obstáculos? Entonces, yo una de las cosas que también creo que tenemos que estar muy pendientes y así un poco a modo como de desafío, ¿no? Y ahí sí que recomiendo también, y recojo algunas de las ideas que, que, que se plasmaron tras la conferencia esa de Culture Crops, que fue la que hizo CAE en el 2019 y publicaron lo que se llama un policy paper, una, una, una serie de reflexiones de, sobre la incidencia política y, y describen muy bien en nueve, en nueve desafíos o, o challenges. Entonces, bueno, algunas ideas sí que tomo de ahí, pero también un poco volviendo a la idea de lo comunitario. ¿no? La idea, para mí, digamos que hay como tres, incluso diría cuatro, cuatro grandes desafíos. Para, la primera para mí es el proceso de cercamiento, que se llama un poco en el, en el, en el lenguaje de los comunes. Ok, lenguaje de los comunes, la idea de, del cercamiento, la idea de la privatización y de la mercantilización, que no es solo de los recursos naturales y que no es solo de los recursos industriales, sino también de nuestra propia creatividad. Yo creo que ahí tenemos que estar muy alertas. Estamos viendo y estamos muy un poco asustadas ¿no? de lo que puede pasarnos. Entonces, bueno, creo que ese cercamiento también puede llegar a la cultura. 
La idea también de, de la impotencia, ¿no? Decía Mariana, Marina Garcés, una filósofa e española, dice, bueno, si nos tocó a la crítica luchar contra la oscuridad, ahora nos toca luchar contra la impotencia. Creo que ese sentido de impotencia es algo, lo hemos dicho aquí antes, lo ha dicho en el panel anterior, creo que es fundamental el que sintamos también que nosotros mismos podemos sentir esa impotencia y que probablemente la única manera de sobreponernos a esa impotencia sea vincularnos con otras, y eso me, me, me parece fundamental record, eh, recordarlo. Y luego también un, un desafío, y de ahí eh, la idea de desespectacularización, ¿no? es la idea de la irrelevancia. Creo que todas las que estamos aquí eh, hemos sentido alguna vez que lo que, hace, que, que, que lo que se plantea, lo que se propone puede ser irrelevante y, y, y nada sería más horroroso para el arte y la cultura que el, el ser irrelevante ¿no? para las comunidades desde las que emerge. Perfecto. Sí, yes, gracias very much. Laura, you have literally 30 segundos to say um, what, because you work very much on national level. So, how does your national work do you think should Like, is it amplified somehow by, by you working internationally? Because I understood you also have quite some international links. But please, very, very briefly, because we are longing to open the floor to the audience. So just to add, uh, so I, I yes, we, we do, do work at a European uh, level because we also are in, a, for example, a network of social and solidarity economy. Um, and we've uh, carried out a co project, which is an Erasmus Plus on territorial cooperation. Um, just to bring that forward, I think for us it was very uh, important and interesting to see uh, the fact that other um, people, other uh, initiatives exist uh, in other uh, rural areas, uh, in other European countries, and we had the same issues, the same uh, values, uh, and the same um, wanting to promote those alternatives, which I think also exist in urban areas, basically, of what you were saying just before, that there's uh, the uh, more productivist versus uh, the importance of what we mean by culture and the importance of those uh, links between the people, which is so important, uh, especially uh, nowadays, uh, that needs to come back uh, again forward. And that in rural areas, there's also um, What we've heard from a lot of artists is saying that there's a, a, a possibilities, there's the possibility to invent new imaginaries and to bring them forward. Um, and so this is, I think, the, the most important. And at the European level, I think it's to empower those initiatives uh, ourselves and to bring forward uh, mm -hmm. uh, this culture, uh, what we mean by culture and, and the importance of, of also rural areas. And, Wonderful. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now um, we have some time to listen. Oh, I'm being said that we don't have that time. <laughs> All right. So there is no questions. Uh, Elena, can I just have one, one further comment? Uh, how much minutes do we have to close it? We have no, so I, unfortunately not. But uh, just to close, yeah, thank you very much, all the speakers, those who are connected and those who are here, and thank you very much, the organizers. I think we, we now, at least for me, I clearly hear that there is so much potential which needs to be brought forward, amplified, supported, and we also heard of the previous panel how it should be better supported at the EU level. So we hope this will be heard and the message will be brought, amplified, brought further. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you a lot. Yes. And let's talk further in an area.